Good afternoon. Um, uh, my name is Justin Poche. I teach American religious history here at Holy Cross. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be here and listen to Dave. And uh, he's really influenced a generation of American religious historians. And uh, it's an equal pleasure to introduce uh, this afternoon's session speaker. Uh, Thomas Segru is the David Boyce Professor of History and Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania, a specialist in 20th century American politics, civil rights, and race. Professor Segru was educated at Columbia, King's College, and Cambridge, and Harvard, where he earned his PhD in 1992. A renowned scholar in the field of American urban history, Professor Segru's first book, The Origins of the Urban Crisis, Race and Inequality in Postwar Detroit, examines the transformation of the urban economy in the 1950s and exposes the structural roots of racial and economic inequality in modern America before the heated struggles of the 1960s. The book won the prestigious Bancroft Prize for Best Book in American History. His recent books include Sweet Land of Liberty, The Forgotten Struggle for Civil Rights in the North, and Not Even Past, Barack Obama and the Burden of Race, both of which offer new and essential perspectives on the long struggle for racial justice in the 20th century. His presentation today is titled Michael Harrington in the Political Economy of Postwar America. Thanks very much, Justin, for the kind introduction. And thanks also for, uh, to Tom Landy for um, inviting me here. Um, and uh, maybe not so much thanks for um, having me follow um, Morris Hisserman and David O'Brien are tough acts to follow, but I'll do my best. It's especially an honor to have the opportunity to reread The Other America. Um, it's a book uh, that I first encountered um, as an undergraduate um, living in New York City at its nadir when homelessness was endemic, uh, when the city was reeling from the after effects of uh, the major economic crisis when rac racial tensions were rife, um, but also a moment when uh, there was a, a post-60s insurgency of activism on the left, uh, when uh, 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 some uh, made the case that the only really viable lefts left in the United States were those maybe most closely allied with Harrington, that is, the religious left uh, and uh, the democratic socialists. Uh, but in any case, um, this is a book that was at the time only 20 years old and uh, to a young budding uh, Catholic activist uh, at Columbia uh, uh, in the early 1980s, about the same age as the book, it's a few months older than I am, uh, uh, Harrington's book really seemed to speak uh, to that moment. It offered a powerful account of the economic and political and social origins of impoverishment and an, a powerful impressionistic account of the enormous tolls that poverty wrought um, on the lives of the poor, especially the indignity of poverty, which was visible on a daily basis uh, on the streets of New York's Upper West Side. Harrington's book uh, is one that uh, emerged out of a very particular moment in American political and intellectual history in the post-Second World War II years. And what I want to do for the next few minutes is to look at Harrington, you could say both in the context of the political history of post-Second World War II America, but especially um, the ways in which he pushed at the boundaries of existing social scientific scholarship uh, and work on inequality, poverty, um, and the American economy. And simultaneously, the ways uh, that Harrington Harrington's analysis uh, was constrained in key respects by um, its uh, place in uh, regards to the social scientific work of the middle of the 20th century. By the time that Harrington discovered poverty, or at least brought poverty uh, 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 to a national and indeed international audience, uh, uh, discussion of poverty had been largely off the table. It wasn't a central concern in the social sciences, although it was rapidly becoming so uh, by 1962. Um, and to a great extent, the vocabulary available to policymakers and social scientists, or to maybe use a war on poverty uh, metaphor, the intellectual arsenal available uh, to scholars uh, and policymakers uh, were uh, inadequate to the task. Several interrelated assumptions about the political economy of post-Second World War II America dominated uh, thought about uh, poverty, inequality, and class in the United States in the 15 or so years after the Second World War. First, 
was an economic orthodoxy that looked to national aggregate indicators of economic prosperity, and by and large downplayed regional variations. Unemployment in this view was a temporary status, an aberration, and areas of the country that were impoverished were seen as residual, or in the language used often uh, by economists at the time, islands in a sea of plenty. At the same time, an emerging labor relations theory emphasized manpower and manpower development, emphasizing unemployment predominantly as a result of indi individual educational or behavioral deficiencies. This de-emphasizes structural origins of joblessness and poverty. Next, and related was a fundamental optimism, one that grew out of the, the consumerist and growth economic assumptions of the post-Second World War II years. A fundamental optimism about the capacity uh, of the labor market to absorb surplus labor, or uh, to use another nautical metaphor common at the time, a rising tide would lift all boats. Harrington's book challenged all of these aspects of orthodoxy. He drew from and grew out of a marginal uh, 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 current, but nonetheless an influential current, mostly on the political left in the 1940s and 1950s, of activists and intellectuals who did offer a counter-economic critique to the hegemonic views that I described, but who did it mostly in the small journals of the left uh, and uh, in the circles of uh, left-leaning labor and civil rights activists who never fully jettisoned uh, uh, their structural analysis for looking at inequality in the United States, even against very significant odds. By the 1950s, these folks were on the margins, largely because of the pall cast by anti-communism. Structural critiques of the economy uh, 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 at that moment fell out of favor, both in intellectual circles, but also in wider political discourse uh, because of their pessimism uh, uh, and because of ways in which they uh, contravened the prevailing uh, wisdom on America's uh, uh, d democratic and capitalist exceptionalisms. When Michael Harrington began writing about poverty, first as an article in Commentary Magazine, he brought a generalist's uh, imagination, a synthetic framework he grabbed from all over the place, he read a lot of cutting edge work, uh, and above all, an orientation toward the problem that um, drew from his place in that left political framework of the 1940s and 1950s, that is an emphasis on the structural explanation for poverty, and simultaneously, um, he drew uh, uh, in ways that I, I will suggest are, are more important than, than many an analysis, analysts have uh, uh, suggested. He drew from a Catholic orientation toward community, toward solidarity, and human dignity, uh, even if he grafted them rather uncomfortably onto the then fashionable uh, culture of poverty theory. While pundits uh, and politicians and leading journalists uh, and intellectuals celebrated American affluence, the supposed embourgeoisement of the working class, the end of ideology, Michael Harrington offered a radically different vision. Harrington's Other America uh, should be read uh, uh, in ways that uh, it was read at the time um, as a corrective to the already hoary cliches and shibboleths uh, that then and now still dominate our images of post-Second World War II American society, one that defaces conflict, ignores the marginal and the poor, writes largely as if there was one America, the America of the white suburban middle class, challenged by some uh, folks on the margins. The world that Harrington observed, and the world uh, that lots of uh, more recent revisionist historians have been reconstructing, is one when the, where the economy is in tremendous flux. This is not a period uh, of ag aggregate affluence, even if the United States was uh, one of the richest countries in the world. It was one where there were not simply islands of poverty, and Harrington rails against the idea that poverty is concentrated in islands by arguing that it was much more widespread, indeed systemic, in every sector of the American economy. And the book carefully lays out 
by essentially taking us on a tour of much of America, showing us uh, 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 that sharecroppers were being subsidized uh, uh, by being, uh, I'm sorry, sharecroppers were being displaced by federally subsidized mechanization. Northern cities were being ravaged by the loss of industry, uh, that small farmers were being supplanted uh, by agribusiness, leaving behind what he called the property poor, uh, and that a class of migrant farm workers, essentially uh, an underpaid proletariat, uh, was uh, roaming the country, uh, working uh, uh, for terrible wages and abysmal living conditions. Each of these he lays out in great detail. He looks at places like the ravaged towns of Appalachia uh, and of northern Pennsylvania and the coal mining country that were left behind by uh, uh, shifts in the extractive industry and offers a compelling account of the ways in which nearly every corner of America uh, had more than pockets of poverty even if that poverty was largely invisible uh, to educated uh, middle class uh, and especially white suburban Americans. The center of the other America is Harrington's discussion of African American and urban poverty. Although he writes compellingly about farm workers uh, and um, the rural poor and Appalachia, he devotes a, a single chapter to African Americans and spends much of his time on urban poverty, befitting the fact that uh, he came from St. Louis, lived in New York City, uh, and had worked uh, at the Catholic Worker in Lower Manhattan. Every major American industrial city between the Second World War and the publication of The Other America, from New York, to my hometown, Detroit, to Harrington's hometown, St. Louis, had lost hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs, mostly entry level, often unionized, many of them fairly stable and secure until they were gone, as firms picked up and relocated to all white suburbs, to small towns and rural areas, particularly in the South, and increasingly abroad. The cap rampant capital flight that was restructuring the American economy in the post-war years, in many respects, was a grim foreshadowing of the process of globalization, of mobile capital in search of cheap labor uh, uh, that uh, we experience uh, from the 1970s on forward. But I would contend uh, it's part and parcel of the same process. That timing was particularly bad for those migrating from rural America to urban America. At a moment when many described rural migrants as lacking the social capital or coming into cities without the experience or acclimation to urbanization and industrialization, Harrington noted the gap between the opportunities that were being made available in cities uh, and uh, the aspirations of those who are migrating there, particularly African Americans. For working class and poor blacks looking to get at the lower rung of the ladder and in the industrial economy uh, in uh, uh, that long belt of the Rust Belt from St. Louis to New York, the 1950s were anything but happy days. Exacerbating this situation was a persistence of a segmented labor market that uh, expanded because of employers taking advantage of surpluses of labor, particularly of uh, minority workers uh, who uh, moved into jobs that whites were unwilling uh, to fill. The Other America was published just shy of a decade after the peak of union membership in the United States. And Harrington noted uh, in ways that were very prescient the growing divide between uh, 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 the best paid and most secure segment of the economy uh, and, and everyone else in the working class. This was a moment when white right to work laws uh, were on the march in the shadow of the more or less complete defeat of the CIO uh, in its organizing efforts in the South. It's a moment when uh, Sunbelt uh, politicians from Strom Thurmond to Barry Goldwater uh, were pushing pro-business policies to attract uh, uh, industry from northern uh, and eastern metropolitan areas to the supposedly friendly business climate, meaning less regulated and non-union business climate of their region. And it's a moment uh, when the once powerful unions, many of them uh, inter integrated and many on the left, uh, began uh, to struggle. The Meatpackers Union, for example, which shows up in the pages of the Other America, one of the most committed uh, to civil rights in the post-Second World War II years, uh, 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 was in the process of steady collapse by the early 1960s. The steel workers uh, started to be ravaged uh, by uh, trade policies that uh, were encouraging uh, the dramatic expansion 
question of the offshore production uh, of, of that commodity. Uh, and uh, uh, garment workers, uh, had been uh, long suffering an exodus of their firms to non-union states like South Carolina and increasingly by the end of the 1960s to the Caribbean. Further exacerbating uh, this uh, policy was uh, something else that Harrington highlights. And here he's drawing from the work of a number of labor economists in the period. He focused on the high costs of automation this is a, an issue that largely fell off of the radar of scholars, uh, especially uh, uh, economists, as the discipline continued to move toward the neoclassical model in the 1960s and 70s and beyond. But uh, Harrington highlights is really central to the story of poverty that he tells. Companies introduced labor-saving technologies, in large part to reduce labor costs and weaken union power. Companies as diverse as electronics, tool and die manufacturing, brewing, and the major automobile manufacturers all introduced automated technologies that essentially pulled away the lowest rungs of the economic ladder uh, for those, uh, especially newcomers coming into cities who quickly found themselves disproportionately represented among the ranks of the poor. This gets to uh, a part of Harrington that I didn't remember uh, until I reread the book uh, last week, and that is he's one of the first writers to highlight the expanding economic sector that was taking place of the jobs that were being lost by deindustrialization and automation. That is, he focuses on the rising service sector. He documents powerfully the insecurity and fragility of the poor paying non-unionized jobs uh, that many uh, uh, living on the brink of poverty were moving into in uh, the post Second World War II years, especially by the early 1960s, uh, jobs in restaurants, in hotels, uh, and in personal care, all places uh, that have disproportionately attracted female, uh, although he didn't spend much time talking about female workers for reasons we can talk about later, uh, or, uh, uh, or um, African-American and more recently new immigrant workers. Harrington then offered a pretty comprehensive and structural analysis, one that was impressionistic but at the same time deeper than much that was being purveyed uh, by more mainstream social scientists, scholars, and certainly journalists in the period. But he also turned his attention to another issue, one that occupied a lot of energy uh, in left and left liberal circles, uh, and that was the relationship of housing. During the post-Second World War II years, uh, inequality was profoundly exacerbated by the reorganization and restructuring of the American housing market. Harrington called this, uh, and this is one of the stronger phases he used in, uses in the book, perhaps the most crucial element in racial poverty. Whites were able to take advantage of government-subsidized mass suburbanization, availing themselves of some of the crown jewels of the New Deal, uh, the pro-home ownership programs created uh, during the Great Depression uh, that made it possible for millions of Americans, almost all of them white, to own their own homes for the first time. Those programs systematically excluded African Americans. Uh, and systematically uh, 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 excluded other racialized minorities in parts of the country that had significant numbers of them. The results were damaging, as Harrington chronicles, not only because they allowed for an accumulation of assets by an already privileged segment of the population, but more than that, uh, created even greater invisibility uh, uh, to uh, the problems of poverty in the United States, for suburbanites at best peered back at the cities they were leaving um, through their rearview mirrors uh, and uh, encountered uh, a city downtowns less and less, uh, mostly uh, uh, through the gulches of the newly constructed expressways uh, that were being uh, constructed after the passage of the Interstate Highway Act in 1956. Those declining urban neighborhoods that whites were leaving behind uh, were uh, uh, places that provided seemingly airtight, irrefutable evidence that African Americans and the poor in general were feckless and irresponsible. They let their neighborhoods go down. This uh, cycle of blame, 
uh, and of middle class innocence was one uh, that Harrington uh, uh, reserved some of his most pointed language in the other America for. He wrote to the middle class in a voice of reason, but also uh, using highly moral language chastised them for their irresponsibility for the problems of poverty in their midst. If it, Harrington was at root a structuralist, someone who emphasized uh, uh, the ways in which markets, the housing market and the labor market, reinforced poverty, at the same time, the book had the impact, as Morris pointed out in his talk this morning, uh, in large part because of its emphasis on the culture of poverty. This, in my view, is the weakest part of the book, not necessarily because of the inherent deficiencies of the idea of a culture of poverty, we can argue about that, but rather because of the ways in which Harrington pulls out the idea of the culture of poverty in ways that aren't very um, grounded in uh, the anthropology or sociology of the topic. He uses it in a rather loose way, uh, an unspecified way. For Harrington, however, Culture was subordinate to the economy. It was the consequence, not the cause of impoverishment. And this would ultimately distinguish Harrington uh, from many policymakers and activists, uh, and uh, uh, especially uh, lawmakers uh, on the political right who saw things just the other way around. In fundamental ways, in Harrington's view, the culture of poverty was the result of the lack of income, the consequence of uh, inadequate health care, but more than that, of the disability, uh, poor mental health and poor physical health uh, that was uh, 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 endemic among the urban poor. And uh, some of the book's most moving passages are descriptions of uh, the uh, problems of mental health uh, in, uh, uh, among the poor in poor populations. So for Harrington, the culture of poverty was a symptom, not a cause. But Harrington's discussion of the culture of poverty um, uh, in, in some ways is much more interesting than a simple borrowing from elements of Oscar Lewis. Harrington's use of the concept of culture in many respects reflects the lingering impact of Catholic social thought on his work. Particularly the personalism of theologians like Jacques Maritain, uh, uh, who uh, greatly inspired the Catholic worker movement of which Harrington had been a part. Um, and uh, I should say Maritain incidentally was also a strong influence uh, on uh, Harrington's um, contemporary, uh, the famous or in some circles infamous community organizer in Chicago, um, Saul Alinsky. Uh, but in many respects, uh, what characterizes the discussion of culture in the other America is its emphasis on uh, a couple of key concepts, community, solidarity, and dignity, and their, counterpoint, their counterpoints. For Harrington, one of the most devastating consequences of poverty, a manifestation of this culture that he vaguely defines, is isolation. For Harrington, isolation is not simply uh, segregation and separateness from the kinds of resources that uh, were available to folks living in more prosper prosperous communities. It was that. But rather, for Harrington, isolation stands in contrast to another ideal that he holds very close, and that is community. For Harrington, isolation meant a lack of connection to the social institutions, to family, uh, to support networks. Unlike uh, um, Harrington, I, I, I think in many respects he overlooked the ways in which um, community existed among at least significant segments of the impoverished population. There were all sorts of resources and inst institutions that were invisible to someone offering a general view uh, like Harrington's and largely invisible to the social scientists and journalists upon which he drew. He can be forgiven uh, for overlooking the ways in which the poor were more resilient um, than, uh, uh, than he believed. But he offered a romantic evocation of community and community formation, particularly among immigrants, uh, which he contrasted to those living in impoverished communities in the 1960s. The next theme uh, that really plays in uh, Harrington is that of dignity, or we could say the dignity of the human person. For Harrington, Poverty led to what he called, and these are his words, depression in a double sense, as applying to the human spirit as well 
as to the national economy. Poverty, in Harrington's view, uh, was devastating not just uh, because it left the poor in poor health or without adequate income, uh, without decent housing, but because it fundamentally stripped them of key elements of their humanity. And to a great extent, uh, that search for human dignity and that call for human dignity is what informs much of his discussion of culture in this book. Ideas take on a life of their own. Books are, in a sense, rewritten uh, by their readers. We read into books things that interest us, and we read out things uh, that don't. Parts of Harrington's uh, book slip to the margins and are seldom commented upon. Other parts prove to be enormously influential. Harrington's emphasis on economic structures, on jobs, and also on what would later be called, he didn't use the term, the spatialization of inequality. That is, the segregation of housing and the balkanization of our metropolitan areas by class and by race, uh, proved in many respects uh, to be influential in shaping the ways in which people on the left thought about poverty, but not so much in terms of the ways in which public policy responded to problems of poverty uh, in the years following the publication of The Other America. The Johnson administration, uh, in many respects, was shaped more by the discourse about poverty uh, and inequality in the economy coming out of mainstream social science than it was Harrington, despite his invitation uh, uh, to uh, meet with uh, White House officials working on the war on poverty. Advocates of manpower uh, development, for example, uh, pushed for the creation of the Job Corps, a program that provided uh, training in CCC camp-like settings for uh, uh, underemployed young men, largely training for jobs that were disappearing in uh, the economy of the United States. The War on Poverty channeled money to job training programs, which varied as locally administrated programs did in quality uh, from place to place. Some of them uh, were directed uh, by uh, folks who uh, shared the same socialist politics uh, as Harrington himself. The Johnson administration also kept its distance from what it considered to be the third rail of policy, that is, the integrated housing that uh, uh, Harrington very forcefully advocated for uh, in the last section of The Other America. Johnson's model cities program and community action programs, uh, by targeting impoverished places, ended up reinforcing rather than undermining patterns of racial segregation in metropolitan America, reinforcing, in other words, uh, part of that uh, process of uh, feedback uh, that Harrington described in The Other America. Finally, Harrington's emphasis on programs that empowered, and he uses the word empowered, which became very trendy uh, by the end of the 1960s and beyond, Harrington's emphasis on programs that empowered the poor by bringing them into urban institutions anticipated much of the community action program, including uh, its vague mandate for maximum feasible participation, uh, but did very little to get at the root causes of poverty that Harrington had so powerfully identified. But even if Harrington's view had its limitations, and even if uh, it uh, took on a, a life of its own in the hands of pundits and policymakers and lawmakers in the middle of the 1960s, uh, Herring and, and went in directions that Harrington had never anticipated, what remains in the other America was its necessary emphasis on structure, but even more so, something that can't be pinned down quite so easily. The reason that a young uh, uh, activist in New York City uh, in the early 1980s picked up the book and read it, and that was passion. And that's what I'd like to um, end my comments about Harrington and the other America with. Harrington offers a very interesting uh, a set of comments in, of all places, the appendix uh, to the other America. He writes, my moral point of departure is a sense of outrage, a feeling that the origins and uh, existing problem of, I'm sorry, the obvious and existing problem of the poor is so shocking that it would be better to describe it in dark tones rather than to minimize it. No one will be hurt if the situation is seen from the most pessimistic point of view. Optimism can lead to complacency and the persistence of the other America. 
At a moment today when many offer uh, a thin optimism for America moving into a post-civil rights or a post-racial era, uh, at a moment uh, 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 this, word, this phrase of Harrington I think has an enormous amount of resonance. In his entire career and in the other America, Harrington embodied, to borrow Antonio Gramsci's famous formulation, pessimism of the intellect but optimism of the will. That might be the most enduring message of the other America. Thank you. Hi, Tom. Uh, Morris Isserman, Hamilton College. That's very interesting, especially the Maritan part, which I'm going to have to give some thought to. Uh, one of the passages in the book that's very striking is when he says that in immigrant communities in the past, you had poverty, but you didn't have the culture of poverty. And um, I, I wonder how that fits with your um, thought that uh, Catholic social teachings are really at the heart of this. Because, of course, he would have been thinking about, first and foremost, his own family's rise in St. Louis, mm -hmm. his grandfather coming over as a penniless immigrant and starting a small business, and his uh, uh, father and mother both becoming educated professionals, and maybe looking at 1950s America and very different migrant groups and, and mm -hmm. not seeing those same kinds of institutions and teachings? Yeah, that's a great question. Harrington um, writes differently in two different parts of the book about um, uh, the comparison of immigrants and the poor, particularly the minority poor. On one hand, he says it's not a good comparison. It's not fair. The situation for um, African Americans and racialized minorities is really different, uh, and um, should be, um, and and they really shouldn't be uh, uh, talked about in the same breath. On the other hand, um, uh, he has a long um, and I would say quite romantic discussion of um, the sense of community that I think very much grows out of um, that. Um, post-suburbanization, mid-20th century Catholic um, romance for the tight-knit ethnic community. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a theme that one sees in, in memoirs and in accounts of the period, but really doesn't get borne out by close scrutiny. Social historians who have um, looked at uh, ethnic and immigrant communities from the 19th century on forward, on one hand, do talk about institutions and solidarity uh, and uh, the, the, the kind of effective ties that were important to uh, maintaining identity in the dramatically uh, transforming uh, 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 ethnic landscape and, and urban landscape of, the, of, of that period. But simultaneously, uh, right of uh, the violence, the profound economic insecurity, uh, the instability, the fragility of families um, that were also um, really commonplace in, in that world. And so um, I, ultimately, I think um, Harrington, in some ways, was falling back too easily um, on um, kind of the shibboleths. I mean, or in other words, if um, he didn't have all that much good ethnic history to draw on at the time. Um, but one really influential book that um, he very well could have picked up and read, given how prolific uh, he was by a historian who was a public intellectual, was um, Oscar Hanlon's uh, uh, book on, on Boston, um, Boston's Immigrants, um, and also his book, The Uprooted, both of which offered a very um, dispiriting account of, uh, of, of immigration and dislocation and the enormous, both you could say psychic costs, but also um, the instability and insecurity of those communities. Of course, a whole generation of, of, of immigrant historians, uh, many of them Hanlon's own students in the 1960s and beyond, went to kind of went in the other direction and talked about solidarity and community um, in, in the very same ways that some of the folks who um, uh, I implicitly criticized uh, Harrington with talking about the lack of institutions and solidarity in black communities went on in the 1970s to talk about how, despite all the obstacles against them, um, African Americans also had a very rich community life and a strong sense of institutions and identities. Uh, so Harrington, in any case, um, I don't think is as nuanced uh, here um, in large part because I think he is very much drawing on that very familiar Catholic trope of the of the solidaristic ghetto, which has elements of truth, but also elements of omission in it. Your comments uh, uh, scratch from me uh, uh, an important distinction that I'd enjoy your comment, uh, thoughts on. The distinction between shamed into better behavior 
uh, versus uh, peddling flavors of self-interest, such as spending more money on imprisonment than on education. Uh, the, uh, the other America seems to believe, I infer from your comments, that America can be shamed into better behavior. I must say, for my part, I'm pessimistic. Yeah. <laughs> um, Harrington believes, like many mid-century left liberals, in the power of persuasion and education, uh, and, and you could say even conversion. That is, uh, present a strong moral argument, um, back it up with uh, facts, write it with passion, and you can win over at least uh, a critical segment of, uh, of, of the population to your side. To some extent, Harrington succeeded in that, and the question of poverty um, had started to come onto the radar domestically. Um, he didn't discover it as such. Journalists had been discovering it since the very late 50s and early 1960s, but, but more so than any other writer at the time, as Morris pointed out in his comments this morning, Harrington really did put that issue um, to the front and center of national debate. And so I think, um, uh, you know, if, if we talk about tilting the, the moral arc of the universe, it, it tilted, you know, um, uh, toward uh, the direction of, uh, of, of anti-poverty um, as, as a consequence of the publication of The Other America. Um, what's interesting about the whole question of shame is the flip side of it. Harrington does not think that shame or that middle class uh, calls for bootstrapping um, will solve the problem of poverty. He is um, pretty uh, fiercely uh, uh, opposed to efforts to try to change uh, the, mor the morality or behavior of poor people. Um, he thinks that, that it will fail, um, and he's dismissive of efforts to... So in some ways, uh, Harrington, I think, uh, uh, um, uh, has a sort of a duality uh, uh, when it comes to questions of moral suasion. He sees that the middle class is open to moral suasion, uh, and the poor not best served by efforts of moral suasion. Um, in terms of, in, in of self-interest and spending, um, <laughs> Harrington you know, um, went on to live through uh, you know, the dramatic reorientation of American uh, policy uh, about poverty away from the limited programs of the war on poverty and great society toward uh, uh, significant federal cutbacks, and with the exception of the dramatic expansion of the carceral state, uh, which happens you know, uh, over the course of his last about you know, 15 years uh, 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 practicing. I haven't read widely enough in Harrington's work to know whether or not he commented on that in, in later books. Some of you who've read uh, Harrington more closely, maybe Morris can, can talk about that, but surely uh, uh, Harrington uh, uh, would see the expansion of those kinds of punitive responses to what he would call the culture of poverty to be immensely problematic. He saw ultimately uh, um, uh, structural solutions going back to jobs and housing is, is totally fundamental and everything else in many respects, um, secondary, tertiary, or um, uh, irrelevant, or at worst, problematic. And certainly, the expansion of the carceral state he would see as very problematic. Uh, Mike Patberg, Boston DSA. I wonder if um, if you could comment on how Harrington. Uh, I'm sure he wrote about this, and if so, what the. Uh, Government subsidized white flight to the suburbs, uh, beginning with you know the highway. Well, probably even before that, but certainly the highway program in the 50s, and the government subsidized destruction of the cities, like urban renewal, so-called in the 60s. You know, combined with race discrimination and the the refusal to subsidize housing rehabilitation in the cities, mm -hmm. but massive subsidies for you know suburban sprawl. Um, and, and if he, if, 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 I'm sure he wrote about this, um, that having led to the isolation of the urban poor and, and basically the sort of fragmentation of society in general. Harrington was very critical of urban renewal, um, of public housing policies that segregated the poor um, and created um, vertical ghettos. Um, uh, he was also, um, uh, very critical of um, federal policies that encouraged mass suburbanization but excluded um, African Americans from, from that process. Um, that said, unlike some critics of urban renewal, um, I'm, I think, for example, of someone who shows up in the pages of Other America in a different context, Martin Anderson, um, who would write The Federal Bulldozer in the mid-1960s, um, Harrington's critique of urban renewal did not lead him uh, to advocate for 
um, one of two possible solutions. One was the devolution of housing policy and authority down to the smallest possible unit, community-based development organizations, um, or, uh, or what Anderson um, argued, the kind of withdrawal of government altogether, because government's always going to muck it up. Um, uh, in Anderson's view, for him, uh, um, uh, the federal bulldozer was, was an example of a problem endemic to, to government policies. They might be well-intentioned, but they're doomed to fail. Harrington, um, in the last part of The Other America, where he lays out policy prescriptions, they're on a level of generality. But he says, um, small community organizations do not have the capacity. They don't have the resources to solve the problems of poverty, the problems too big. Local governments uh, and state governments uh, uh, don't have the capacity, in the case of states, are beholden to a conjuries of, uh, of anti-urban interests that uh, will prevent a systemic uh, anti-poverty policy from being implemented on the state, state level. Ultimately, he, said the, he says, I have misgivings. The federal government is imperfect, to say the least. But it is the only body with the resources and the capacity and the ability uh, to override um, uh, the limitations of the states and localities to deal with a pressing problem of poverty. It has to be on the federal level, he says, and he's very pointed about that. Um, what happens in the years following the publication of The Other America is um, activists on the left argue for the devolution of power down to the level of citizen participation, kind of a version of maximum feasible participation. And those on the right say uh, the problems are too, uh, uh, should, be, should be solved uh, by, by local governments and left in those hands. Harrington very fiercely opposed uh, those kinds of programs. One of the ones he came out most strongly uh, against, um, and for reasons that go beyond the kind of cliched debate that plays out in a lot of the scholarship is the debate about school decentralization and community control of education. Um, he contended, rightly, I think, uh, that uh, this small-scale uh, decentralization projects would essentially reinforce the structural patterns of spatial inequality, of segregation um, that kept uh, minorities um, disproportionately ranked, uh, disproportionately based uh, kind of uh, um, in the ranks of the, uh, of the impoverished, and argued very strongly that you needed larger institutions. He thought, even though he wasn't a political scientist, and he doesn't even write that much about electoral politics or, or, or politics in the other America, he still thought very politically about um, the ways in which um, uh, public policy uh, is uh, 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 crucial or has serious limitations in dealing with questions of poverty and reinforcing or undermining uh, the structures that he describes so powerfully in the other America. Uh, I, I knew Mike, and I was a, a good friend of Mike's, and one of the things that uh, I'm hearing is that Mike had the audacity to tackle so a broad a uh, swath of American life and thinking, and yet uh, when you said he wasn't a political scientist, and he wasn't a sociologist, and he wasn't a historian, and it was an act of absolute chutzpah for, for him to undertake this. And one of the things I guess I'd have to say is we, don't, we really don't have any people like that, any public intellectuals around today like Mike, who on the one hand are trusted and on the other have the ability to get away with this kind of analysis, I'm, that's, that's kind of what I'm suddenly mm -hmm. faced with or see. Yes, um, I, I, I think you know, had uh, Harrington um, been a more narrow gauge social scientist, um, his work wouldn't have had the same resonance as it did. But look, this, uh, this came up a little bit in, in the discussion this morning uh, with Morris about the proliferation of enormously influential paradigm shifting books in the early and mid 1960s. There was uh, a, a wider acceptance generally of public intellectuals, um, intellectuals are never as prominent or as visible as Mike Harrington, right? Um, a lot of the economists who wrote about dry subjects like labor economics had their books published by trade publishing houses and disseminated to audiences that um, those of us in the academy, uh, with a handful of exceptions, um, uh, can only dream of reaching with our, with our work today, uh, in part because of the transformation of the publishing world, in part because of the hyper-specialization um, that has remade um, large segments of the American academy. Harrington was, as I put it earlier, um, a generalist and someone with a synthetic imagination. And um, that's what gives 
the, uh, 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 the other America, ultimately the power that it has, he's able to read um, more than superficially, um, in most cases, um, uh, in the work of economists, sociologists, anthropologists, political scientists, um, and to, to pull them up to a level that makes the book accessible to anyone. Um, you know, this is a book that can be read more or less in one sitting. You know, I, I sat down and, and reread The Other America um, uh, in, in preparation for my remarks today you know, in, a, in a few hours. Um, uh, you know, it's, 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 really, it's a really fast and, and, and quick read. And honestly, at, at any moment in our past, uh, even if public intellectuals in some ways may have had more truck at that critical moment in the early 1960s, there are precious few people who can both kind of have a, a, a big picture and some degree of rigor and also pitch it to a wider audience. I mean, that does come at a cost. I mean, there are, there are, are places where I feel like I'm skating out on really thin ice in the other America where, where you fall through. But just as you're about to fall through, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a real rock that you can cl clamber back onto again of something that's really well supported in, um, in the scholarship and the ideas that he's been reading and engaging in the, in the 1950s and early 1960s. Well, Brian, um, I'm fascinated by the uh, Maritain. Uh, Maritain in Europe was able to give a point of view that allowed Catholics and the Christian Democratic parties after the war to participate in secular government with some credible commitment to the common good. But the big question here is solidarity and the common good, I think. And in, Morris says in his book that when Michael was first considering socialism, he went to see John Courtney Murray, who the American kind of counterpart of, of, uh, of Maritain. And um, the, the big question is solidarity. Maritain was so influential on that generation that formulated things before and during the Second Vatican Council, but there are very, very strong theological currents today who think he took, us on the, took the church on the wrong track. Mm -hmm. And that unless the church is itself, it's kind of the old Karl Barth thing, the church must be the church, the church must be a kind of sacramental community, and only then will it have the power to resist the evil of the state. And Chile, uh, Poland, other places where uh, that's grown out of. And you can't really, the church cannot as church and Christians as Christians cannot fully kind of participate in shaping the public world, only find their strength in opposition or resistance. Mm -hmm. So we are left, I think, with the yearning that post-immigrant Catholics like Michael had, they had that sense of solidarity growing up. They had an experiences of solidarity, just as trade unionists did and others. But experiences of solidarity fade away from us. And the huge question is, how do you, Barack Obama, how do you get the common good? How do you get the common good, not just as a policy formulation, that's hard enough, but as something to which people think is so important that they're willing to subordinate not just economic self-interest, but moral and religious and other kinds of Self-interest, that's the big question, isn't it? Huh? And uh, Murray and, and, uh, and uh, Maritain didn't get us there. And I'm trying to figure out where, how we get there. You were Michael Kazin and uh, Morris. I think it's bit, one of the big questions in American intellectual history is how do you, and Michael, I think, in the, in the end, kept coming back and saying it's got to be almost like a religious commitment. You have to make a voluntary dedication to the common good. The quote that Morris has at the end of his article about um, the other America, that in the end it's poised to the non-poor and it's saying to you that for your own sake, for your own highest good, huh, you must subordinate self-interest to, to uplifting the poor and creating a community of, of mm -hmm. genuine shared responsibility and solidarity. Is there any other way to get there <laughs> other than this evangelistic appeal to individual conversion and commitment and organization, and that Michael would add, joining an organization that mm -hmm. wants to speak for and act for the common good. That's why some of us once joined the DSA, you know, <laughs> and, and DSAC and those socialist organizations. But. Right, that's, I, I, in some ways that's such a big question I'm not even gonna um, yeah. dare to try to answer it, except for to say that um, one thing that comes through on, in my reading of, of The Other American and, and other work by Harrington is um, 
the, the idea that solidarity is not just the sum of lots of individual choices to come together, but rather um, it has to take institutional form uh, because institutions are essential for um, creating a, a sense of something greater than the individual, um, of serving as a unit for political activism, organization, and putting pressure. Um, and uh, it, seems, it seems very clear to me that um, he, while he believed, to go back to my point about moral suasion, he clearly didn't see that as sufficient. In other words, it wasn't just a bunch of middle class people reading this book who all of a sudden would have the shingles fall from their eyes and see that there was poverty in America, but rather that they needed to um, uh, coordinate and act collectively. And that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a really tough challenge, especially at a moment um, in the 1960s when so many of the institutions that Harrington had himself come up in, uh, the, you know, the Democratic Party, the Catholic Church, um, the trade union movement were all really starting to come under siege from all sorts of different quarters, sometimes for good reasons. And so um, uh, that, that poses Im immense problems in terms of creating the kind of solidarity I think he would see as necessary as the first step towards um, the kind of systemic change that he believed was um, crucial to el eliminating poverty. Uh, Dan Geary again. I'm just wondering, I was struck by what you said about Harrington's concern about social isolation mm -hmm. as one of the negative consequences of poverty. And I'm struck by that because there's a whole discourse at this time that, that actually the suburban middle class has become quite isolated and is losing community. It does Harrington, in a sense, sort of normalize the American middle class and say they have, you know, because they have the resources, they have community, they have dignity, when in fact, you know, that's something that's very much being challenged. Uh, uh, at the time, yeah, that's that's a really good question. I mean, he um, he's critical of the middle class, um, but he doesn't um, uh, kind of pull a lonely crowd um, on uh, um, on his readers. He's fundamentally interested in the ways in which the middle class um, um, distances itself from both the reality of poverty, but also an understanding of and. Uh, um, uh, and, and the responsibility for poverty. And so that's, that's I think, a, a different kind of take on the middle class than, um, uh, than what we saw in a lot of the social criticism of the post-war period. Where he's getting isolation from, I don't know, actually. I mean, uh, except for in that it serves, at least as I'm reading it, as a, as a really powerful juxtaposition to community. For him, um, um, community has a, a, a deeper meaning than the kind of sense of community or the, you know, um, uh, uh, the kind of that lost world that a lot of the um, more secular intellectuals are writing about in the, in, in the 1950s. Um, but uh, um, it's interesting because isolation takes on a life of its own after Harrington in the work of urban sociologists. Um, uh, William Julius Wilson, for example, um, you know, highlights um, isolation as really one of the central um, uh, components of the, the new urban poverty, um, um, arguing in this case that the, uh, the, the black poor are isolated from um, the moderating influence of social control um, and the institutional presence of middle class in their communities as um, uh, better off African Americans withdraw from, uh, um, from class integrated neighborhoods. I think he overstates that um, pretty profoundly, but that's a, a more, um, uh, that's a narrower understanding of isolation than the understanding of isolation that pervades the other America. Um, they're, they're, they're the same words, but Harrington is really, really sees isolation in some ways as much more of a spiritual thing. Um, it's, it's something that, uh, that, that deprives people's lives of, of, of kind of a, a fundamental sense of humanity. And that's a very different framework from the more um, uh, sort of uh, um, urban sociological vantage point that came to prevail in a lot of the work on the so-called urban underclass in the 1980s and 1990s. I want to thank you very much for your presentation. It's wonderful. I teach uh, U.S. history in the Department of Youth Services, children at risk. And um, in reviewing everything that's been said, it seems like there's a, a great cycle for uh, social movements. 1840s, we had a great movement. Civil War came along. And at the turn of the 20th century, you have Jacob Rees and his incredible photographs of the slums of New York and Sinclair Lewis about meatpacking. 
And then in the 50s and 60s, you get this social rush. I'd like you to make a comment on uh, what that one single shot in Memphis, Tennessee did. <laughs> well, uh, as a historian, I'm not too much into counterfactuals, you know, sort of anything the what if. Um, uh, um, that one single shot in Memphis was truly devastating on many different levels. Um, but King was also at the nadir of his popularity nationally in 1968. Um, the positions he took on, on poverty and on militarism in Vietnam um, uh, um, led him to really fall a lot in the eyes of folks who had, in some cases, lionized him even, even just a few years earlier. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we've had these various moments of uh, insurgency, of reform, um, and um, I, I will be very parsimonious as a historian in saying whether or not we ha we're due for one anytime soon. Um, uh, the arc of history sometimes bends towards justice, but it sometimes veers off course. And um, uh, there's um, nothing to me inevitable about, you know, I, I don't subscribe, in other words, to kind of the cycle of history um, um, uh, theory that, um, that, that different folks kind of put forth. Um, we have not seen uh, a, a, a very significant insurgency on the left. The Occupy movement we're going to talk about later on this afternoon, perhaps it's going in that direction, but we have a long way to go to recover um, some of the extraordinary passion, and more than that, the pressure that those movements put on elected officials. Um, and I would say this is maybe one last point to make about Harrington, because I think my time is just about to run out, but Harrington was part of an impulse on the left um, that saw an opening in national politics in the early 1960s. Kennedy administration, which is you know the, the, the moment when the other America is being written, you know, was inching towards addressing some of these structural problems, but was pretty cautious on a lot of things, including civil rights and, and, e and economic policy. But the, the systematic efforts of folks and the civil rights movement, um, in more radical parts of that movement, of of, of intellectuals like Harrington, um, seeing that moment of possible opening and being a wedge to put pressure on, on, on that administration um, did veer that arc a little bit. Maybe not as far as Mike Harrington wanted it to go. I think in many respects he, he, he saw both sides of the war on poverty. You know, he, he thinks it was better than um, what, what could have happened, but, but um, very much insufficient in terms of dealing with problems. When he writes his, his sequel to this book in some ways on, on poverty um, uh, 20 years later, um, he's still incredibly pessimistic and, and notes many of the limitations of, of the movement and, and the politics of, of the 1960s, as well as some of his accomplishments. So, uh, you know, I guess the lesson in some ways is that we need a lot more Mike Harringtons to, to be in the mix to um, uh, put pressure uh, uh, and, and veer things. And uh, whether that happens or not, I think, is still very much an open question. Great. Thank you.